All right, so uh, today's topic is caching demystified, a guide for the non-techie. Uh, if you happen to be here and you're a developer, um, you may still learn some things, but this particular guide is intended to be a little bit easier for people to understand some of the concepts behind caching and some of the related performance concepts um, as well. So um, I'm Micah Wood. Uh, you can find me if you just Google WP Scholar. Um, and uh, so I'm, you can find me on Twitter, I have a website. Um, I work at Bluehost and let's get started. So, um, so what is caching, right? So we wanna start with, uh, you know, figuring out a little bit more about what it is and then we can kind of uh, talk a little bit more about the details of it. So in a short summary, uh, caching is nothing more than storing something so that things can be faster in the future, right? So in the case of the web, we're talking about storing a web page or some piece of data um, so that any request for that same thing in the future can be handled much faster. Um, so good example of this from everyday use is I like to make omelets in the morning. I usually use three eggs um, and I can just go to the fridge and grab three eggs and make an omelet. And the reason why is because I have cached the eggs in the fridge. <laughs> um, I don't have to go to the grocery store, um, which is also a caching location, right? Uh, Otherwise, I'd have to have my own chickens or uh, go wherever the chickens are, right? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, um, simple, simple concept um, that we can all relate to. And then uh, we also have this concept of cache invalidation, right? So we have uh, caching, which is kind of shortcutting the work. Uh, and then we have invalidation, which is when a resource expires. Um, so sticking with the grocery store analogy, uh, talking about milk, um, you know, you, you buy your milk, you usually check the date before you buy it, and then you put it in the fridge. And then as that date gets closer, um, things start getting a little vague, right? Like clearly there's been plenty of times when that date is passed and the milk is still good. Um, sometimes the milk goes bad before that date, uh, <laughs> depends on whether somebody left it out or, uh, you know, maybe depends on the type of uh, container that the milk is in or uh, a whole bunch of different factors, right? So um, invalidating cash, um, usually there is uh, a point in time at which it is clearly invalid. In this case, the milk is clearly no good. Everyone can smell it. If you put it in your mouth, it's coming right back out, right? Uh, but there's kind of this vague place in between sometimes where, um, you know, maybe it's expired, maybe it's not, we're not really sure. This is also kind of a case on uh, when talking about web technology, because uh, there's a number, of, a number of reasons why something may no longer be cached, even though it hasn't exceeded its due date, essentially. Um, so just something to be aware of. And when we're talking about <clears throat> um, caches, uh, you know, you, you can manually clear a cache or invalidate a cache. Uh, and so there's, depending on the tool you're using, there's a bunch of different ways to do that. A common pattern is in the little admin bar that shows at the top of your site when you're logged in. Um, there will often be some uh, option there where you can clear your cache, depending on what caching plugin you're using, or maybe what web host you have, or, you know, any number of factors, right? Um, so just knowing that you can clear it and, and becoming familiar with where that is, uh, is important. So a common use case for um, caching. Uh, well, let's kind of run through, you know, why why we do it, right? So obviously, I think the 
the thing most people think about when they think about caching is things will be faster, right? The website will load faster. Uh, if your website loads faster, your server, your web host can actually handle more traffic. So um, more traffic is always good. Uh, and then because it's faster, Google will also be happy. And so your search engine optimization slash rankings uh, potentially could be higher. And then uh, probably the more important thing is that the user experience is improved, right? So um, Walmart did a study and I'm not sure the exact numbers, but I'll, they're pretty close. Um, so Walmart found that for every, I think it was like a half second delay in page load, um, a pretty significant number of people would leave the website uh, if they were made to wait a, a iota longer. <laughs> um, so it, it boiled down to for every, I think it was like every half second that they could shave off, um, they increased their sales by several million dollars. Um, so performance had a direct impact, not just on the user experience, but on the bottom line for the company. Um, now, obviously, Walmart's a big company and they have lots of people that would visit their site. Um, but likewise, you know, speed imp speed improvements can definitely help with your own e-commerce sales as well as just your user experience. So there's a few types of caching and really we're not covering all the different types of caching. We're covering the most common ones, the ones that everyone should really kind of be aware of. Um, so. When we're talking about caching, uh, the first thing we want to do is talk about CDNs. So we have the content delivery network, uh, which is where files are stored in the cloud uh, and they're usually stored in multiple locations, right? So if I'm in the US and I have a website and people come to my website from all over the world, you know, I need to have uh, some files stored in Africa, some files stored in China, some files stored in Australia and everywhere uh, so that if somebody from those locations tries to visit my site, it doesn't take as long to go and fetch those files, right? So in that case, we're, excuse me, we're shortcutting the, um, the, the long distance internet travel there. Uh, and the CDN will let you have policies and set up that that say how long a file should last in the CDN before it kind of refreshes and goes back to the source. Um, and again, with any kind of caching, you can also purge it. So you can purge your CDN. Um, and there's a lot of different tools that fall under this CDN category. Um, this is just a generic category um, that we're talking about. So next we have the browser cache. So the browser cache is when content is stored on the user's computer. So if I visit a website, site loads up, uh, maybe you have uh, created some rules on your side as a website owner that say, I don't know, like your logo needs to be cached on the user's computer. So that way, if they go to multiple pages on your site, they're not reloading your logo every time, right? So that's a simple example. And going back to our grocery store an our analogy, the browser cache is essentially our fridge, right? It's uh, it's the thing in our house where <laughs> that's stored, uh, and it makes it real, real easy, real accessible. It's probably the fastest way uh, for something to load is to not have to go fetch it at all. Um, but if you think about that grocery store analogy, where I had to go to the grocery store. That's the CDN, right? That's my localized place where I can go and get what it is that I need, even though the chickens and the eggs may be, you know, halfway across the U.S. Uh, so, yeah, so that's the basics of a browser cache. Uh, usually the user has to flush the, main, the browser cache. So if something gets cached uh, and you don't want it to be, you can't always control it. Um, and then we have uh, something we call object cache and object cache is the official name, but I think an easier way to kind of think about it is data cache. 
data cache is where we're not really talking about you know of caching a file or a web page. Uh, we're talking about caching bits and pieces of data. So this would be, <clears throat> you know, if uh, if there's some, let's say there's some option uh, that your site has that you set uh, that option, that specific setting for a specific plugin or theme or whatever it is, would be stored in the database. And normally, WordPress would have to go look it up every time a page loads and say, ah, yeah, that's the setting, and we're going to use that. Uh, but if we catch it, uh, WordPress doesn't have to go and make a query to the database. It can just say, I have this thing I'm looking for. Do you have it? And if so, the object cache will return it. And if not, then it'll go and do the extra work it needs to do to kind of find that in the database. So <clears throat> object cache can really help, particularly like your, uh, you know, normally you don't do a whole lot of caching in the admin, the back end side of WordPress, but an object cache can be used to speed up your admin area. Uh, so it's a good, good thing to keep in mind. Um, yeah, and of course we have expirations uh, for these things as well. Uh, but uh, kind of an interesting thing to be aware of is that the more stuff you start to try to cram into this object cache, at some point, it's going to hit a memory limit. And the memory limit is something like, sometimes it's like two megabytes, which is not a whole lot. Um, so if you start cramming everything under the sun under there, it's going to push old things out, even though technically they would normally still be valid. Um, <clears throat> so something to be aware of. Um, it may not be something that you as a user have much control over outside of maybe if this does start happening, it could be that a particular plugin is just putting too much in there and it could be like pick another plugin kind of situation. Uh, but your web host is typically going to be the provider for your object cache. Um, it's pretty rare uh, unless you're doing like configuring your own servers or something uh, that that would not be the case. So then we have something called page cache, right? So everybody is more familiar with just the fact that a web page will load up. And, and so caching that, the work that's done to grab all the pieces of the data and to um, you know pull in all the files, uh, those things could come from other types of cache. But once the whole page is assembled, we can then cache that whole page, the generated page, uh, so that it, everything loads faster. Uh, so this is URL-based. Um, and then it's possible that uh, somebody might send a request to your site and request that it not be cached, in which case they would bypass the cache. So for example, uh, if I were to, I have a Mac, so I use command R to refresh a web page, uh, but I think on uh, Windows, it's just control R. But if I use command shift R, it's a hard refresh. And that basically tells, uh, tells the browser not to cache what it's about to fetch uh, and it'll it'll load up a fresh version of the page. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about best practices. So caching is an enhancement um, <clears throat> that provides better performance. Uh, so this uh, Concept is really intended a little bit more for developers than anything, just because uh, sometimes developers try to use caching in a way that's more of a feature than an enhancement. Uh, but if you happen upon some sort of plugin uh, that seems to break down, depending on whether caching is or isn't enabled, um, it could be that, that that plugin, that developer, isn't viewing caching as an enhancement. Um, so just something to keep in mind. So like we said before, uh, caches do have limits. You can't cache everything. Uh, so at some point, things will get kind of pushed out. Uh, so we do have to be aware of potentially bad actors, right? Plugins or themes that are maybe doing too much in the way of caching to the point that the cache actually becomes useless, useless 
um, and pushes everything out before it actually can be used again. Uh, so this is this is uh, definitely something that your average WordPress user can control uh, from most caching plugins, right? So uh, caching is essentially a balance between performance and data freshness. Uh, so if you are wanting a really fast website, sometimes you have to make sacrifices in that data freshness category, right? So if... Um, if I want real-time results, I may have to give up some performance um, because, you know, if data is mission critical, uh, then having it be five minutes old could be bad or 24 hours old or however long it is that you're caching, right? So being able to adjust how long something caches uh, is kind of where you, you end up landing on the spectrum between performance and data freshness. So you have to be careful that you don't cache uh, dynamic content. And I know WordPress is dynamic in the sense that it, you know, you can change stuff in the back end and it shows up on the front end. Uh, but a lot of times, it, most pages are often static, right? Like you'll create your content in the back end. And then unless you make another change in the back end, it's not actually going to change the front end of the site. Uh, but when we're talking about dynamic content, you know, having a page like an e-commerce page uh, for a shopping cart, uh, that's dynamic, right? It's specific to the user and things that they put in their shopping cart. So what I see is going to be different from what you see, and it has nothing to do with what the uh, site owner has done on the back end of the site. Um, you know, the, they're not putting carts, uh, products in your cart for you. Uh, <clears throat> so the the danger with dynamic content and caching is that if we do caching wrong, right? If we misconfigure it, I could go to your site, you know, nothing's cached at the moment. And I go to the checkout page or uh, the shopping cart and I've put, I don't know, five products in there. Well, that could get cached. And the next person who comes, even though they put one product in, they could land on your uh, uh, shopping cart and see my products, not theirs. And there's four, not one. Uh, and so it could lead to a lot of confusion, but there's also situations where uh, it could it could lead to data leaks. So consider, let's say, the check out page where someone is typing in their contact information and their email and their phone number. Um, if for some reason all of that data got cached uh, onto a page, then the next person that comes along could see all of that. So most plugins, caching plugins, will take into account default settings for like WooCommerce and a lot of the kind of more common uh, e-commerce situations. Uh, so that's just something to be aware of. But if you do run into this uh, situation, uh, just be aware. Uh, and it can happen with other plugins that, you know, are expected to work in a little bit more dynamic fashion on just random pages that you may implement uh, some uh, some of that functionality on. So, oh yeah, so someone was saying, I'll back up for a second in the chat here. By the way, if you do have a question or a comment, feel free to leave it in the chat. I, I do glance over there every minute or two and uh, I'll try to respond, but someone was saying their state's lottery website actually let them see other people's info. Um, so perfect example. Uh, we got a couple questions here. Um, how do I determine if I should use my hostings options versus my plugins? I'm building a site for someone using SiteGround with Jetpack. SiteGround's options are overwhelming to them, and the Jetpack options may be redundant or not enough. Um, good question. That's actually a lead in to kind of my next point. Um, so we'll get we'll cover that. Uh, other question: Will you be pointing out mitigating circumstances? So. Um, to a degree, yes, uh, but if you have specifics as we get uh, closer to the end, I'll I'll try to address some of those kinds of situations. So <clears throat> uh, never use more than one of the same method of caching. So again, to uh, the point of the question that was asked here, 
if you have a web host that does, I don't know, let's say two or three potential methods of caching, and then you have a plugin that does a couple methods of caching, and maybe you have um, something like Cloudflare, which sits between your uh, web host and the user, uh, could provide some level of caching. Um, and sometimes people will install multiple caching plugins. This is usually a bad idea. Even if you correctly configure them, it's just going to be confusing to anybody that comes later. So I'd highly recommend getting a caching plugin that is going to serve all of your needs and not just some. Uh, we don't want to have to supplement another caching plugin to, to be able to kind of compensate. So, <clears throat> um, so again, first step, first step is to ask your web host what caching they have, right? So that could be just call up support and say, do you have object caching? Do you have page caching? Do you have um, a CDN? Uh, a lot of times uh, it should be pretty obvious from the, the UI. So for example, I know Kinsta, they have uh, a CDN built in. Um, but a lot of web hosts don't. Uh, same goes with object caching. A lot of people, a lot of web hosts have object caching, but some don't. Uh, so just being aware of those things, like I said, um, object caching sometimes is a matter of switching hosts to get it, uh, whereas a lot of the other types of caching could be supplemented by a plugin. <clears throat> so uh, we'll talk a little bit more, I think, about that, but uh, that's the that's the basics there. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about some other performance concepts. Uh, so first of all, uh, minifying. So this is not a pure caching concept. It's more of a performance concept. So Minifying is, uh, you know, there's a lot of files that exist on your host, on your server, uh, that make up your website, right? WordPress itself has thousands of files. Um, plugins can have one or many files. Uh, and each plugin could load um, a specific code file uh, for the style, for the uh, on-page functionality. Uh, so there's a lot of types of files that might get loaded up. Uh, and all of these files are, are basically code. And code doesn't have to be human readable, right? As long as a computer can understand it, it doesn't matter. So <clears throat> minifying is basically when we make the file take up less space by getting rid of any white spaces, any tabs, any comments, any, uh, you know, names of things. Like, let's say we had a thing called, uh, I don't know, concept A, right? We could shorten it to the letter A. And now that's a lot less letters. Uh, it takes up a lot less space. And if we happen to use concept A 100 times somewhere in this file, now we've reduced it by I don't know, what is that, like 600 um, characters at least. Um, so that's the, the idea of minifying. We're just kind of compressing it uh, compressing it down by making it take up less, less space. And then we have another concept, which is concatenation. So concatenation is very similar in that we are, um, we're, we're trying to make things take up less space, right? <laughs> Um, but the space we're talking about now is the number of requests that the browser has to make to go get all of the things that it needs, right? So all of those different types of files that we talked about, they still have to load for everything to work right. Um, but you might have, I've seen in cases, uh, you know, 50, 60 files responsible just for the styling of the page, right? And all those have to be loaded for all the little things from all the little plugins to be properly working. Likewise, you might have 60 files that are handling the on-page functionality, the interactions that happen with the user. So all of these files, uh, I think the typically the browser can only request like eight files at a time, I think. You know, it can request and get those pretty quickly depending on your internet speed. But again, like there's kind of a blocker there, right? A bottleneck. So if we can take 60 files and turn them into one file, now we've unblocked a whole lot of uh, requests that the browser doesn't have to 
make anymore. So we are basically take multiple files, mash them all into a single file, and then things get a lot faster. Uh, then we have something called compressing. Compressing is kind of like minifying, but it's a little bit different. Um, minifying is more about removing things that are unnecessary. Uh, and there is some renaming of things, but the names often still have to exist. Compressing is when um, you know, maybe you take some shortcuts. Uh, so for example, uh, let's talk Braille, for example. Uh, so if you're blind, you read Braille and, um, you, you know, normally you would think, okay, well, Braille is just a bunch of letters. Um, but Braille actually uses a form of compression where they take commonly used patterns like the letters E and R, um, and they'll make that one character. Um, so it kind of shortens up things and makes things a lot more succinct. So when we're compressing, that happens at a kind of a much grander scale, right? Like we got large files and lots of uh, different algorithms that could be run to figure out what's the best way to compress and, uh, and handle a, a given file. Uh, so for example, a lot of people don't know this, but if you take a, your average PNG file, uh, the reason it takes a little while to compress that down to a smaller size is um, most compression tools will throw 50 different uh, algorithms at it and try each one and come up with the end result file. And then it will choose the smallest file um, from that. And then that's how it'll know what compression algorithm to use for that specific file. Um, so <clears throat> it's all kind of interesting, but if you're familiar with zip file, you know, you put stuff in it, zip it up, it's a smaller, you unzip it, it's bigger. Um, it's the same, same kind of idea. And then we have lazy loading. So lazy loading is when um, images on a page that are not in view yet are not loaded until you scroll down to where they actually should show. Um, so hopefully that was succinct enough, but there are some like things that maybe aren't specifically dependent on scrolling. So let's say you had a big uh, hero uh, slider on the front of your homepage. Uh, in the case of that, because one image would be on screen and the rest would be off, the off screen images wouldn't load until the slider progressed to the next image. Um, so Similar idea, if you got a big gallery of 50 images and you start to scroll from the first, I don't know, three or four maybe would show up. And then as you continue to scroll, the next row would show. Um, so in that scenario, you're saving the initial load of 50 images that could block the user's ability to interact with the page, which obviously that's a lot of images and that is a lot of uh, time waiting, which is a lot of people who are likely to leave your site and not do what you want them to do on the site. Uh, so lazy loading can really help if you have something that's really image heavy <laughs> or just in general, usually. Um, so then we have implementation options, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the tools that are out there, uh, as well as, um, pros, cons, and, and maybe talk a little bit about some of the additional features that we haven't hit on yet. Um, so. First of all, like we said, uh, your web host, it's important to understand what kinds of caching that they provide and if there are any steps you might need to take to enable or disable the caching um, or different types of caching. So a lot of hosts might give you an option to enable or disable things. Um, and obviously if you've got you know, a plugin and Cloudflare and web host and all of these things are kind of playing together, uh, you may want to consider turning things off at a particular level and, and you know, handling them using a specific tool. Um, I think as we mentioned before, if you have, let's say, two types of page caching, one at your web host, one at a plugin, um, there's an issue, right? Because let's say you've already come up with that equation of data freshness and you said, well, 24 hours is acceptable. Anything past that is not. Uh, so you've got web hosts caching for 24 hours, but then you've got a plugin caching for 24 hours. 
And so what's actually going to happen is you're going to have a 48-hour uh, time where content might not update. Uh, so, you know, just be aware that you know, one thing that's caching could be cached by another thing that's caching. And then even though this cache is cleared, this one's still running. And so it could double, <laughs> uh, you know, the amount of time something's cached. So here's an example, Bluehost, right? So uh, we give you the ability to turn the entire cache on or off. Uh, you can choose the caching level. And so it talks a little bit here about how long things are cached. So if you do assets only, it'll cache things like images um, and it will only um, cache for like five minutes. And then as you kind of work your way up, you know, we're talking about six hours and it's caching some additional things. And then, you know, later down the road here, we're talking more like a week. Um, <clears throat> but again, if you need to clear your cache, we have the clear everything button and that will purge everything out of the cache and, and it'll all refresh. So just so you know, as far as caching goes, the most common thing that I see where people kind of get hung up is they'll go and update a page in the admin and they'll go to the front end of the site and they'll see the content there that they just changed. They're logged in. Uh, so the re because you're logged in, most of the time things aren't cached if you're logged in. So then uh, somebody else will open it up on their computer um, and, and they're not logged in and they're seeing the old content. Uh, when you encounter a situation like that, that would be when you might need to clear the cache to have that show up correctly. Um, <clears throat> so if you're seeing things differently when you're logged out versus logged in or when you're on one computer versus another, 99% of the time, it's some sort of caching that's happening uh, so that you, you'll want to go find out. Uh, which which thing is being cached and how to how to clear it um, or reconfigure it so that it auto clears your cache. So here's an example from Kinsta. Um, they have under their tools section for a given site uh, a site cache tool uh, where you can clear the cache and, and modify your caching settings. Uh, here's SiteGround. Uh, and some of these screenshots, by the way, may be a little bit out of date. Um, but yeah, so quick question here, refreshing the browser window would also fix that for the person seeing the older version. Yes. Um, so yeah, so if you do a refresh in the browser, it doesn't always clear the cache because some the cache a lot of times so like page caching is often done at the server level as well as at the browser level. So if we're talking browser cache, doing... Uh, a hard refresh will flush your browser cache, but it may not flush the cache at the server level. Uh, so that's where you'd have to go and manually clear the cache. A smart caching tool is going to automatically clear the cache on the server as you update content. So if you update a post, it's going to clear the cache for that specific post and nothing else uh, so that you would see the new content. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, so SiteGround, uh, they have their super cacher. Um, you know, I blurred out some stuff here, but uh, you know, you can toggle things on and off. Um, they have mem cache, which is just a type of object cache. Um, so they have different types of caching available. Um, and you know, becoming familiar with with what's there is important. Um, and then, he, yeah, and then here's WP Engine. They're a little bit more clear about what types of caches they have. And um, so they actually call their caches page cache, object cache, network cache, and all these different things. So, uh, so you have a single page you can go to for a site. You can hit a button to clear everything. Or if you want to clear just a specific type of cache, you can do that. <clears throat> and I believe they have um, some toggles here where somewhere later on the page where you can turn certain things on or off, like maybe you don't want object caching or whatever the case may be. So then Cloudflare. Cloudflare is one of those things, if you're just an average WordPress user, you may not be familiar with. Um, but like I said, Cloudflare sits between the user and the website. Um, and so the cool thing about that is because it's in between, uh, 
if a request is made to your website, Cloudflare is monitoring what's going on, uh, the, the traffic that's coming through to your site, and it can pick up on patterns, right? So it can say, ah, well, I've detected that this traffic is coming from some random bot in whatever country that you probably don't care about, right? So it can, it has some features where it can like automatically block bots and prevent security issues. You know, they have, you depending on if you have a paid plan, uh, there's actually a WordPress firewall that you can put in place. So while a lot of people will use a security plugin for that, uh, Cloudflare actually will provide that. Um, and the nice thing is that traffic, that those bad actors that are trying to hit your website, um, that traffic never hits your site. So that means that you actually have uh, more resources available to the valid traffic that Cloudflare does let through. Um, so technically, while it's not a caching feature, it's a security feature, it actually improves the performance of your site because your site's not being brought down and resources aren't being consumed by non-users um, as much. But yeah, so the free plan has page caching and browser caching and minification and they have CDN. Um, so there's a lot of functionality there that you can take advantage of in addition to security. Uh, and then just as like a personal side note, I actually have all of my domains uh, registered via Cloudflare just because they don't actually mark up the cost of the domains uh, like most anywhere else you go. Um, so here's a view of kind of what it looks like to be inside of Cloudflare. Like I said, they have tons of stuff, uh, firewall, uh, security, speed. Uh, this is their caching section. Uh, so they have the ability to purge things. You can change how long, um, you know, the rules for how long things stay in someone's browser cache. Um, and so they have all kinds of different settings. The cool thing here is that you can actually hit the help uh, button below any one of these, and it will give you a very detailed description of what's going on and why you might want to choose one thing over another. Uh, so very, very helpful. So getting into more of the WordPress plugin territory. Um, oh yeah. So someone asked if I could repeat what I said about Cloudflare and domain names. So Cloudflare is a no markup domain registrar which means that, uh, you know, most places you go, you buy a domain, it's like, I don't know, 10 bucks um, for a year, let's say. Uh, but that's, they're marketing up, let's say a few bucks or something like that, um, or probably a lot more than that. But uh, let's say it was two bucks. Um, on um, Cloudflare, you can get that same domain for like $8, um, where you probably wouldn't find that deal anywhere else. So um, yeah, they, Hosting domains is just uh, a side thing they're, for them. Uh, they're, they're, their intent is to bring you in, but they don't really make all that much money off the domains. Um, all right, so plugin territory. Uh, what we have here is WP Rocket. WP Rocket is one of the paid plugins that I would highly recommend for uh, caching and general performance. Um, because there are some performance things that are not caching. Um, so they help you out with the minification concatenation performance aspects. Um, they have support for a CDN, um, but you actually do have to plug that in. Um, they have uh, support for browser caching. Um, they have Z, uh, gzip compression, which is something we haven't actually talked about, but gzip compression is where the website or the plugin on the website in this case Will, will compress files before it gets sent across the wire to the user's browser. And then the user's browser knows about gzip, so it can then uncompress the files. So whereas you might have a file that's five, um, five megabytes that's being sent because it's compressed, it might be two megabytes. And so only two megabytes get sent over. Uh, but then in the end, it gets unzipped and it's it's normal five megabyte cell. So it actually saves, um, obviously saves performance and, and time to send things um, to different users. Um, it also reduces the carbon footprint of, of your website. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so WP Rocket, this is kind of a 
their user interface. Um, yeah, CDN is, uh, yeah, question was, is CDN related to caching? CDN is definitely related to caching. Um, it's essentially taking your files and storing them around the world uh, so that, you know, who, based off of where I am, I get the files that are closest to me. Um, but yeah, so WP Rocket has a bunch of different options here. So again, CDN, you can plug that in. Uh, they do database optimization, which is not something we've talked about. Um, but there are certain things, you know, um, like revisions. If you've, for some reason, told WordPress to store all the revisions, it will indefinitely store all the revisions. <laughs> uh, and so eventually you want to go clean those out. Um, there are some settings that you can set to restrict that, um, but that is just one of a several things you might want to clean up uh, in terms of your database. Um, and then we, yeah, we have lazy load support over here and the file optimization, that's your minification, concatenation, um, and those kinds of things. So then in kind of, uh, well, well the, the nice thing about WP Rocket is it's paid plugin so that you actually have a, the ability to reach out to support. Um, <clears throat> some of the other free plugins don't, you know, you're just kind of on your own if you have a problem. Um, but of course, then some of these do have a uh, paid version. So Comet Cache has a paid version, which has a lot more uh, advanced features, but their free plugin does browser caching and gzip compression and, and page caching. And if you don't want to be overwhelmed with settings, this one just has a yes or no, on or off. <laughs> so pretty simple configuration. Um, I think WP Rocket, it's a, a good balance between simple configuration and not going too crazy overboard, but still giving you control you need. Um, this is probably a little, um, well, it's super basic. Uh, but then in contrast, we have W3 Total Cache, which is again, a free plugin, uh, but it gives you so much control that if you don't know enough about caching and configuration of caching, this one could be very overwhelming. Um, so lots of features, probably more so than most of the free plugins you'll see. Um, but as you can see from the UI, you know, we have like 10 different pages here, all with probably 10 different settings. Um, so if you if you really, really want to get down and dirty with all of your settings and configurations, this will let you do it. And you can turn things on and off uh, pretty easily. So if you know that your host only does this and you need a plugin to handle the rest, um, you can configure this to kind of work uh, work with what you've got already set up. But yeah, most people find this pretty overwhelming. I don't typically see this on a site unless it was set up by a developer. Um, but if you feel after this talk, hopefully you feel a little more confident. Um, I don't know if you would be this confident, but <laughs> we'll see. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone did mention that if you um, if you have a free plugin, there is a support um, forum on WordPress.org. Uh, but again some so depending some tools don't actually answer questions there it's more of a community thing some developers do answer questions there so uh, it, it's really up to the developer how they handle that um, <clears throat> yeah and somebody else is agreeing w3 total cache is very intimidating so definitely not my recommended starting place um, so then we have this thing called cache enabler which uh, has Again, some relatively simple options. And you know, it does page caching, minification, compression. Um, so as you can see here, not too many settings, you know, just enough. Uh, if you're kind of new to this, um, this one should be relatively easy to configure. Um, unless you get too much into these exclusions, because it's all regular expressions, which most users don't understand. Um, and that's where I think uh WP Rocket's a good option just because they don't make you do that kind of thing. They just say, here, put this on a line. Here's the patterns you can use. And it doesn't get too complicated. Regular expressions are crazy developer code for good match any one of these 
million things a million different ways. Um, so WP Optimize is another one. This one actually started out, I think, as more of a database optimization tool and then started to turn more into a, uh, a, a caching type plugin uh, with you know, a, a lot of the standard uh, performance and optimization things that you would see. Uh, so <clears throat> I think they have a lot more options as far as the database goes. Uh, so as you can see, the database is the first thing listed here. And then they have images, uh, so you can handle uh, some optimizations there. And then they have the caching section uh, where they have, you know, configurations for the GZIP compressions and file headers and preloading and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so auto-optimize is also uh, a tool that I think mostly when it started, it was more about minification concatenation, uh, but then it's kind of expanded as well into some more of the general caching uh, functionality. So as you can see here, we have the JS, CSS, and HTML. These are the types of files, web files uh, that would exist. And so you can check a box to say, I want to optimize the JavaScript code. And so you can minify and concatenate each of these types of files. Um, and then you have your images. So that would be where like lazy loading and some of that kind of stuff might live. And then we have something called critical CSS. So CSS is essentially the documents that are part of your website that control what your site looks like, how things are laid out, what color things are, um, just the general look and feel of the site. <clears throat> so the problem here is with CSS, a lot of times uh, I've seen CSS is say 10,000 lines, <laughs> uh, which is a lot of lines. Um, but when we're talking about critical CSS, uh, it is the CSS required to only style and lay out the part of the site or the page that you're on that you actually see when it first loads. So what we call above the fold, uh, the part that the user sees when they first hit the site, uh, critical CSS only handles that. And then all the other lines of code will get loaded later. Um, so that's the, that's the idea behind critical CSS. Uh, some tools will just let you plug in your own if you figured that out by yourself. Uh, I know WP Rocket will auto-generate critical CSS it's not perfect all the time, but it actually does a pretty good job and can significantly speed up in, uh, your site and improve your core web vitals. Uh, <clears throat> then we have the SuperCache plugin, which was a plugin that was created by Automatic. Uh, so this is what the UI looks like for that. So they do have kind of a simple on-off. So that's their easy tab. Obviously, you can go to the advanced tab and some of these others to get a little bit more control. Um, but again, this is just another, another option. Um, and then we're going to kind of switch gears. This isn't so much caching as it is, um, dealing with the image compression. <clears throat> um, yeah, someone's asking if I have any impressions of W3 fastest cache. Um, to be honest, I have not gone looking at too many caching plugins outside of this, uh, uh, presentation. So I think I'd probably, probably skip that one when I was, uh, looking, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so smush is a free WordPress plugin and I, and they do have a paid version, but I'll tell you what that paid version does. Uh, so the free version, anytime you upload an image into WordPress, it will automatically compress or optimize that image, uh, for it saves it and all of its different image sizes that it may be creating. Um, and if you're not familiar with how WordPress handles images, when you upload, let's say a big image, uh, whatever image sizes that the theme and any plugins register, um, WordPress creates one copy of that image for each image size that's registered. So I think by default, WordPress has, was it like three, three or four image sizes? Um, and so typically you upload one image, you are going to end up with five. So all of these are be, are going to be optimized. 
um, so that they're much smaller than they would normally be. So I tell people, you know, if you take a picture on your iPhone, usually it's seven megabytes. In general, we'd like a web page to be less than one and a half megs. Um, it's just like a general guideline. <clears throat> so obviously, if you're uploading a seven megabyte image and loading that onto a page, especially if you have a page with multiple images, you've well exceeded that and your site's going to be really slow. But with a tool like this, you can actually take a seven meg image and make it something smaller than a meg. Um, and that that will help a lot. <clears throat> so, yeah, so the problem with Smush is that you, is if you have images that are already on your site that weren't optimized and then you install Smush, uh, that's where you get to the difference between the free version and the paid version. The free version only lets you optimize like, I don't know, 50 or 100 images at a time. Uh, but if you pay, you can click a button, it'll just run through all of them without you having to sit there and click, click, click. So if you have a lot of images, uh, like say a thousand images, uh, you'll be clicking a lot just to try to go back and optimize all those. <clears throat> so this is what smush looks like. Um, you know, if you have bulk smush, and like I said, if you pay, uh, you can kind of smush them all at once. And then we have another one here, the Magify, Imageify, however you want to say it. Um, I like Imageify for some reason. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this one's just a free plugin, does the exact same thing, um, but it's a, a service as well. So you pay a monthly fee and you can basically optimize it. Oh, I pay for the unlimited version. It's like 10 bucks a month. Uh, so if you happen to work with a whole bunch of sites, you can actually just plug it into all your sites um, and you don't have to worry about multiple licenses or anything like that. Um, it's just, you're covered. And then even if you want to optimize images outside of WordPress, you can just go to their website, drag some images up and it will optimize them. So it's a good option. And it works perfectly well with um, actually, uh, Magify works with uh, WP Rocket. They ba they basically promote WP Rocket inside of their plugin, and WP Rocket promotes Magify inside of there. So they they work together. They have a partnership there. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's look at some of these questions here. Let's see some of these comments. Uh, don't know if you've addressed, but I've been confused about whether I can use image optimization plugin with a caching plugin. Yes, because we're talking about a performance uh, tool versus a caching tool. Again, we don't want to mix types of caching, but um, but image optimization is actually totally separate from caching. So yes, you can absolutely use those together. Um, if you, let's see, a lot more questions. I'm going to try to keep up. Uh, looks good if you look at the amount of active installations when it was last updated. Okay, they're talking about the fastest cache plugin. Um, yeah, feel like a broken record reminding people to compress before adding to the media library. Maybe you should just allow clients to rely on a plugin instead. Like I said, clients, if you have clients, Imagify is the way to go, I think. Um, uh, used it for someone. Okay, gotcha. Um, I have squash on my computer. Do my compression first. Don't have a big department or helpers, a few small sites. Um, let's see. I'm not sure the question actually was gotten to there, but uh, does using a CDN avoid the need to compress images? Um, that depends on your CDN. So there are some CDNs out there that will actually go above and beyond uh, just like storing files and returning them. Um, there are specific uh, image CDNs that will detect um, that, you know, obviously they're going to keep a copy of your image. They will optimize that image for you. And they'll even go a step further where when your site loads up, it will detect, you know, what type of device is being used. Are you on a mobile device? Are you a desktop? Or, you know, what's the situation? And it will know... Um, and create different image sizes. You know, we were talking about image sizes in WordPress. Uh, sometimes we'll have a big giant image and that giant image might be used on both desktop and mobile. 
Well, Google's not really going to like that, especially on mobile, because it's going to try to load this giant image when it's really only needs to be about, you know, yay big, if you can, if you can see my hands. Um, so the CDN will actually size those images, not just optimize, but resize them to fit that particular spot um, and, and return them that way. So it, it's a really good option. So if you're looking for CDNs, um, you know, find out a little bit about some of those features. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's got some chatter about squoosh uh, for one-off image optimization. Let's see, unsure if we answer this question. I came in late. Uh, don't know if you've addressed and been confused about whether I can use image optimization. Okay, yeah, that was that was answered. Um, but yeah, so maybe to clarify about what's a caching plugin, what's not a caching plugin, um, all the caching plugins are here on the right. And then, uh, you know, some of the things we've mentioned that are not caching plugins are over here on the left. Uh, as we said, Cloudflare is actually a service. It's not a plugin, uh, but it can do caching, um, which you would want to take into account with some of the other tools. And again, WP Rocket actually plays really well with Cloudflare and Magify. So this is why I'm kind of a fan of WP Rocket um, because I use Cloudflare. I use Magify, use WP Rocket. They all play well together. So if you're looking for a good set of tools, I'd probably mostly recommend that. Um, but yeah, uh, so there's some resources here. Let me, I'll, I'll grab a copy of the link for these slides and I'll put them on the meetup page uh, as soon as we're done here. And that way you can reference uh, the links as well as um, you know the information here. So I guess we're right at time. So hopefully we've, answered everyone's questions. And if you do have follow-up questions, you can just shoot me a tweet uh, at WP Scholar and, or just on my website, wpscholar.com and I'll try to follow up. So appreciate it.